Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Monday, October the 25th edition of Track Announcers Notebook. Pat Gonzalez, along with my co-host, Stuart Nodell. And uh, as always, off the top of the show, before we get to our special guest, 2021 Canadian Superbike Champion, Alex Duma, we've got uh, Nodell's notes. Stuart? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just want to welcome Alex along with us for this evening. And uh, just to share some sad news, as you mentioned, Pat, uh, the passing of Wes Cooley. I know we'll do a, a tribute. To, uh, we've got a whole slideshow of photos uh, donated by both Bill Petro and Colin Fraser, but just wanted to acknowledge his passing last week of diabetes. Yeah, very, very sad. Wes Cooley, uh, a great rider, you know, uh, got to know him uh, a little bit in the late 70s uh, when I was going to Daytona. And of course, the years he came up here and was the uh, big American rider that the late Harvey Udis would uh, uh, hire to come in here to race against the best of our Canadians and really add to the uh, race weekends at, uh, at Mosport back in the late 70s early 80s we'll talk a little bit about him and then in other news pat uh ken mcadam just announced the soar regional series uh 2022 racing calendar and uh so you can just see here there's six rounds uh scheduled for the 2022 season and it is pretty similar i think to uh what he normally does run and hopefully with him posting his so early some of the other series running in ontario can um we can have less conflicts than we had this past year. Yeah, just looking uh, at that uh, at that schedule, uh, Stuart. I think it's it's very similar to what Ken has been running. Uh, these are, from what I can see, his traditional dates. I certainly don't see any uh, blatant conflicts with uh, with CSBK, uh, and hopefully both uh, Pro Six Cycle GP and the Super Series at Shannonville can avoid uh, conflicts as uh, Ken is out first uh, with his schedule, all at Grand Bend, running on the various track configurations. And uh, I was able to get down there for their uh, their final round. And he has done a, a great job in building, uh, building that series. So you see uh, a late May start, that's usually the case. And then wrapping up on that first weekend of October, a total of six rounds. And I'm assuming that October weekend is going to be a, uh, a double header, but we'll, we'll get Ken on uh, over the winter here to talk a little bit about the series and any changes in terms of class structure, uh, prize money, awards, all of that stuff. But um, good to see uh, a schedule that starts in May and not, uh, and not July as we had this year. Yeah, absolutely. And on a side note with the SOAR series, Pat, just wanted to share with everyone that uh, Mike Grass has also posted some uh, video that uh, he is improving with his health. He still does have a long road, but he, he was uh, sending out his thanks to everyone for all their love and support. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Well, Mike uh, is, uh, is a real trooper and uh, what a courageous guy. And he has uh, battled back for, from some horrific injuries that we we wish him uh, all the best and uh, we'll continue to follow his progress. And at the right time, uh, maybe we'll look at bringing uh, Mike, uh, Mike on the show to talk about his uh, journey back from that uh, crash in August. For sure. And then uh, MotoGP race this past weekend, Pat, and Yamaha's Fabio Quattararo, he did uh, clinch the championship in the premier class. It was a pretty dramatic uh, race weekend. I know you and I were talking a little bit about it earlier, um, but uh, Fabio did uh, clinch the championship, and he's the first French rider to uh, to win the the premier class of the World uh, MotoGP World Championship. And obviously, we have a French Canadian rider who's also won the Canadian championship. So, a uh, pretty cool French theme we've got going on tonight. All right, très belle performance uh, for uh, Monsieur Quattararo. And that's about the extent of my uh, my French. Uh, Stuart, what did you think about the race? I know we were chatting, Mark Marquez, um, and I felt that right at the early rounds in the championship wasn't 100%. Uh, 
but I think there was probably pressure and, and he wanted to get back on track. And I think as he's gotten healthier and more confident, I think we're seeing the results where his win on the weekend was his third of the year. He's sitting sixth in the championship and just 10 uh, points out of, uh, out of fourth place. So those last two uh, rounds coming up in Portugal and then I think Spain is the finale that uh, I think we could see a, a, a significant shuffling of the top 10 rankings in, uh, in MotoGP. Yeah, I agree, Pat. He's riding with a lot of confidence, looked great out there this weekend. And I think he's starting to get back to his old self. So I'm really looking forward to 2022 because there's a lot of uh, guys that with just a few years experience, but they're showing signs of getting really quick. And Nia Bastianini is the rookie rider that uh, chased down Quattararo on that last or second to last lap to take the last podium spot. And then this was the results from the rate, or this is the results in the standings right now where you can see he's clinched the championship. And as you said, Mark Marquez is sitting in sixth and, and he's got people he's going to probably catch. Yeah, it's 25 points for the win. So maximum uh, that uh, Bagnaya could uh, could get here would be 352. So mathematically, uh, that is uh, the impossible. That's not going to happen. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Marquez, I think likely into the top five and maybe even uh, finishing fourth in the championship. But as you can see, his... Uh, his wins have come uh, towards the end of the season, and that is back-to-back -back Coda, and then uh, Italy on uh, yesterday. Yeah, and uh, also in Moto2 action, that race was pretty exciting too, Pat. Raul Fernandez, the, the record-setting rookie who's won a number of races this year, he did get to the front of the field, but unfortunately had a huge crash about you know with about 10 laps to go in that race. And uh, he was mathematically, he'd actually passed Remy Gardner. He's a little bit back now, you can see in the standings, but with two races left, he's still mathematically in it, but I, I, it might be tough to uh, overcome that. But it wasn't without drama. Remy Gardner had to take a long lap penalty and he ended up finishing eighth in the race. So it was sort of a blessing in disguise for Remy, I think this past weekend. Yeah, I think, you know, Fernandez knows he's got to go out and win the next two races. And uh, that 18 point uh, deficit, uh, if he can do that and a couple of other riders get between him and uh, Gardner, he might be able to win the championship. But Gardner's got some points to play with. And um, let's bring in Alex Dumas here because Alex was in a somewhat similar situation going into the final superbike races at uh, Calabogi on uh, September 17th and 18th. I think he had a, a 10 point lead. Uh, Alex, uh, what does uh, Raul Fernandez have, uh, have to do there? Uh, you I guess Remy Gardner is sort of your position going into those final uh, two races. How do you uh, mentally look at it? Are you just going out there to win or are you playing for the championship and winning races is secondary? Uh, I mean, for sure. And uh, when I look at the Moto2 guys, like they're, they're really close together and there's a lot of different guys that they're like, there's, there's a couple of guys that can actually win, but there's a lot of guys that can be up there and there's so many like passes and different stuff going, uh, going on during the race that it's, I mean, 18 points is not, not a lot for uh, two race weekends left. So it's going to be pretty tight. Um, I mean, Gardner, had, I mean, 18 points, not too bad, but he's, he has to uh, always stay in, in the, the front pack with the, the other guys. And uh, Fernandez really has to just try to win both races. Yeah, indeed. Stuart? Yeah, and then just quickly, the Moto3 class is tightening up. Uh, the wonder kid, Pedro Acosta, he's uh, he's sort of letting Dennis Foggia really take big chunks out of his points. He did with 65 points about two rounds ago. He's had a crash. He did finish on the podium, so he does have a slight advantage. But to me, Moto3, is a, it's unpredictable. So it's anybody's race with two to go. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that class is so competitive. Uh, you know, you can be eight, ninth, and you go to the next track, and you know you're, uh, you know you're not even in the top ten. So uh, 
I think that one's going to go to the, down to the final round as well. And then in other news, Pat, there's been some changes at the Canadian Rider Safety Fund, and John Bickle has resigned his position as the chairman, and uh, Chris Chappelle, who's involved with CSBK uh, Pro 6's Grand Prix Series, I used to operate uh, the Race Super Series at Shannonville back from when I raced. He's going to be the acting chair for the time being, but it looks like they're going to add new people to the board of directors and possibly um, expanding some of their safety. <laughs> I think it's uh, hopefully uh, bigger and better things. And as they make, you know, they're here to obviously protect the riders and racers across all of the racetracks throughout Canada. Yeah, indeed. And, and John Bickle has been a, a long time uh, supporter and proponent for uh, Canadian rider safety. I think he is moving on and will uh, hopefully hand the torch on to some new blood who can go in there. The big thing right now, is to find creative ways to secure the funds to buy the soft foam barriers, uh, the bags for the bottle bags. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to look at further air fencing. Air fencing is expensive. It takes uh, a lot of labor to set it up, to take it down, to keep it in shape. And all of the air fencing that, uh, that we had that had been secured over the years had uh, sort of uh, gone beyond its best before date. So I think this is an opportunity to, to revisit all things with, uh, within rider safety. And uh, hopefully we can uh, be one of the mechanisms for getting the word out there. And Stuart, I just started to work on that Canadian motorcycle industry and racing uh, golf tournament. And uh, one of the uh, charities or motorcycle causes that funds are going to be directed to is the Canadian Rider Safety Fund. But um, yeah, I've got some ideas that I'm going to be talking to Colin Fraser about. But I think in, uh, in the coming weeks and months, we're going to see uh, some further word as to the new direction and the new initiatives and some of the uh, new people who are going to be on the uh, on the board and the group that's going to help move this thing forward. Yeah, and I think also we should point out uh, a huge congratulations or thank you should go to Rob Egan of Brooklyn Cycle Racing. He obviously administers a lot of the safety equipment. He, he, he helps maintain it. He brings it from round to round. So hopefully uh, things will just continue to improve on that safety front. Indeed. And then in some of the uh, rumors out there, Pat and Moto America, it sounds like this writer, Daniello Petrucci, um, is rumored to take on the HSBK um, factory Ducati ride in Moto America Superbike for 2022. Apparently, more Ducati course involvement uh, from the, the factory itself. So it'll be interesting to see if that program becomes more competitive going into 2022. Yeah, sort of a, a reverse direction going from Moto GP to Moto America Superbike, but very talented rider. And Loris Baz, of course, who rode that Ducati this year headed for uh, World Superbike. So this is the time of year that we have all these, uh, you know, rumors and con confirmation of rider changes. And yeah, looking forward to, to seeing how he will do in, uh, in Moto America. Well, uh, Jake Gagne, I don't think uh, is going to maybe have it as easy as he did this year. Yeah, maybe not. I guess on the Ducati front, It'd be great. Uh, I wonder if even Ducati would entertain coming back to the CSPK series since guys like Alex, Ben Young, and Jordan Zoke, who's coming back uh, next year and he wants to try and uh, win that championship back from Alex. Uh, maybe Ducati will play a role in our series here, Pat. Well, I would love to have them back. And then that's it for the Nodell's notes. I just thought we'd close it here with this photo of Alex. Maybe he can explain this tradition that's been happening more and more this year amongst the, the front runners and uh, look forward to hearing what you and Alex have to say. All right, Alex, tell us what was in the boot. Was it straight vodka? Was it milk? Was it champagne or, or maple syrup? No, just beer. Beer. Okay. Better still. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Stuart, we'll get to our tribute to Wes Cooley in the last uh, five or ten minutes. But uh, first of all, Alec, uh, 
congratulations on uh, being the youngest Canadian yeah. Superbike champion. When you look back on the uh, on the seven seven races that made up the championship, four wins, a couple of seconds, and a third. Uh, that's uh, pretty consistent. Always on the podium, and was that a goal? Looking at an abbreviated schedule, that to win the championship, you had to be on the podium at every round, and just one race off of the podium would probably mean you weren't going to win the championship. Was that what you talked with uh, Patrice Goyet with going into the uh, the season? Uh, for sure, with only uh, seven races in the whole championship, I knew that uh, that we couldn't really get a like a like a bad luck kind of like a crash or just a mechanical or something. I knew we always had to be up up and finishing the races. So uh, I then knew that it took four like four race wins and the rest of podium to actually win the championship. So it was pretty fun to have uh, two competitive guys through all the whole uh, all the races it was really fun to race with but uh yeah i kind of because in motor america usually we have uh 20 depending on what class you're racing you have like 20 races or at least uh 12 so uh it's a lot more than only seven so it was a pretty pretty short um season but uh still a lot of fun and it just because it's a little bit more uh, stressful it's just, it just, it's not a, uh, it's a little bit harder to just try to say like, okay, you got to really like perform in that race and you, you don't, you don't really have like a break that you can say, all right, I'll just settle in second or third. So uh, it's always like a, a little bit of a pressure, but at the same time, it's always fun to improve and uh, be a little bit faster all the time. So yeah, it was a really good season. After Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, you had only a 10-point uh, lead going in to Calabogie, but uh, somehow you managed to win your first pole position of the, uh, of the season. What changed, or maybe it's a combination of the motorcycle and your comfort with Calabogie, where you were able to shave pretty much two seconds off of where you had run uh, in July, where I think the laps were two minutes two, and you guys were down to a two minute flat when you were there in September. Where where did that improvement come from? I'd say uh, half is getting more comfortable with the track because uh, when we left from the first round, I knew that like it's it was a new track. I only I rode it uh, three days of the track day before the race weekend. So it was a little bit, but not not enough to really learn the track as good as what uh, Jordan and the old, uh, and Ben and all the other guys uh, know it. So uh, I knew the next time I, when we were going to come back in September, I knew that I would just I could uh, shave off a couple uh, seconds, maybe a second or and a half or two. So uh, and then another thing is my uh, the bike setup for Mossport. We, we made a pretty big change for the the rear uh, traction from the rear tire so that make a uh, that made a pretty big difference for Mossport and also at Calabogie so that that helped a lot and also we tweaked a little bit the bike with Patrice but uh, I'd say it's half the bike and half the the more track time all righty um the constructors championship for Suzuki going into the final uh, races at Calabogie. Is that something that you talked to uh, Trevor Daly about? Because he, Trevor had a pretty good weekend finishing on the, uh, on the podium there. Yeah, no, I didn't really talk about it with Trevor, but I knew uh, Suzuki is the only, I, I feel like the only two, uh, the only manufacturer that has more than one good rider up front in the top five during the whole season. So I pretty much knew that from the, the get go that Suzuki was going to win. If if nobody has a bad luck or something, that it's going to be the the winner of the the manufacturer uh, championship. So uh, that was really good, and I was really impressed with uh, how Trevor uh, rode at uh, Calabogie at the end, the last uh, race. So it was cool to see him on the podium. 
And throughout the uh, the season, in in addition to trying to win your first superbike championship, uh, I think you were still going through flight school, and you were spending quite a few days at Shannonville Motorsport Park uh, with the fast riding school. Uh, did either one of those uh, aspects of uh, your life throughout the summer? help or hinder what you were trying to do on the racetrack to win that superbike championship? Of course, to uh, teach at fast, uh, even though I'm not uh, riding at a hundred percent was uh, still, uh, it was trying to, it was still like training my eyes and just my, my body to just to still be like uh, to be on a motorcycle. Cause I'm always, even though I'm not going, as quick as when I'm racing, when I teach somebody, when I teach uh, students, I still uh, apply all my uh, my efforts, my inputs, the same as if I was going quicker. So my body position, uh, my change on the bike, all my my smoothness with braking and uh, throttle, I'm I'm still applying them. It's just at the lower pace, but it's still the same. So I was still practicing, and we made we did a lot of uh, of days at fast this year. So you know all uh condensed together so i was almost every every week or two i was always on the bike and riding around on the track so i think that helped me a lot because uh i'm the kind of rider that needs a little bit of uh, track time to get uh to stay uh fast i know there's a couple guys like in one america or world superbike they can just hop on the bike after two months and they're quick like that but i i need a little bit more track time but uh, I know in, in the CSBK, we don't have that opportunity to uh, to ride during the winter and be able to go with testing really early in the season and do a lot of uh, tracks during the season. So it's a little bit, uh, it's something that I got to gotta get used to a little bit. And I kind of got a taste of it uh, this year. So, but uh, no, it's, it's pretty good. What about next year? Are you going to be back at the uh, fast riding school or is that still to be decided? It's still to be decided. Uh, I, I've talked with Marte a, a little bit, the owner of uh, fast riding school, and uh, he'd love me to have, uh, to have me back next year. So I think that's, uh, it's not a hundred percent sure, but uh, yeah, I really want to go and uh, go and teach at fast again uh, next year. I really love all the, all the other uh, instructors and uh, I think it's a really really nice uh, way to learn how to ride a, a motorcycle uh, even though even for uh, street riders to go over there and learn how to ride on the track uh, can help you a lot also on the street or even new people that wants to learn how to ride uh, on the track and do track days it's uh, I feel like it's one of the best ways to to learn and uh, it's safe and it's yeah so yeah, the plan for next year would be uh, to do that, continue teaching at the uh, fast riding school. Okay, speaking of next year, um, is your program for 2022 100% locked in? Are you gonna be back at CSBK or are there other potential rides that uh, you know, you're still looking at? I will be a hundred percent sure uh, in CSBK next year. So hundred percent, you're back on the uh, on the Suzuki. And any any changes to the team? Is Patrice back with you? Are you looking at uh, at making any changes to how things uh, were run this year? Um, we're still working uh, with the sponsors. We're still talking to uh, sponsors, but for sure it's going to be with uh, Patrice next year. And uh, he's going to be still my, my crew chief. And we're going to continue uh, to race in the CSBK. It's just not, we're just not 100% sure what, uh, what our sponsors are going to be. But we're going to race in CSBK next year. Okay. So assuming the, uh, the CSBK schedule is its traditional uh, schedule where you're looking at, you know, six, seven rounds and, hopefully 12 to 14 superbike races. Um, any plans to race outside of Canada at some selected Moto America or, or other events such as, you know, maybe the Daytona 200 now that Moto America is, uh, is gonna be running that and it's gonna be FIM super sport rules. 
Um, we don't know yet. We might. Uh, I think it's more something that we, we're going to pro- maybe decide on uh, early uh, next year. But uh, we, we don't know. It's up in the air. We don't. We don't really know. All we know is that we're going to race in the CSBK in Superbike for next year. But the rest we don't know. If we if we have the opportunity to go do uh, some races in Mount America or whatever, we might do it. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much up in the air. How did you spend uh, after the weekend having wrapped up the championship? Where was the uh, the celebration with the team? A local restaurant in the area? Or how did, uh, how did you guys celebrate uh, being the youngest Canadian superbike champion? At a uh, truck stop. <laughs> At a truck stop. Yeah, on the road back back home. All right. Now, what, what was on the menu at the truck stop? Uh, burgers. I, I can't remember, but it was just. Uh, I think it's like an hour and a half uh, from Calabogie. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't remember. It's it's already been a month and so. All right. No, I can't okay. remember. But yeah, it was fun. All right. and, and how good is it going to be to uh, run the number one plate on your bike this coming season? Because you have done that in some other classes. I've uh, I've never run the number one plate. Before. Oh, you haven't? No, I've never got the the opportunity to race a year after I won a, a championship in the same class. So uh, it's going to be different. Uh, I'll be running number one plate next year. But uh, no, it's gonna be pretty cool to see uh, the number one on my on my bike. So yeah, yeah. Uh, forward to it. Alex, in the days uh, following that weekend at Calabogie, uh, who were some of the people that you heard from uh, that reached out either on social media or directly to you to congratulate you on your uh, Superbike Championship? For instance, uh, did you hear from John Ulrich? Or Chris Ulrich. Uh, I I don't think so. I can't remember. Probably. I just, I just there's so many people that I know send me uh, messages and on Instagram, Facebook, or just by a text message. And so, who who are some of those people that we might know? I don't know. It mo- mostly friends and uh, family and and people from the the sport. But uh, I don't know. Like yeah, I, I, I'm probably gonna have to look to my phone. But uh, all right. And then, so what? Uh, what have you been doing uh, following the uh, Superbike Championship the last month? What's your schedule been like? Have you had to make appearances with uh, Suzuki dealers, or what? What's that been about the last month? Uh, I, I didn't get the opportunity to do uh, to go through dealers and uh, really do uh, motorcycle shows because of uh, COVID. But uh, I've been pretty busy with uh, flight school. Okay. Uh, since now I'm not. Um, we're not in the racing season anymore and doesn't it doesn't take uh, time off my schedule i can really uh do more uh flying uh school so it's been it's been pretty good uh it's been uh, also uh i've been uh, improving a lot so yeah that's pretty fun and uh yeah i've been i don't know i've been just working a little bit on my my uh my uh, small uh, TTR 125 back home on my uh, track. I've been riding a little bit too. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we're gonna put back the, the the motorcycles back up in the second floor of the garage and taking down the snowmobiles. So. All right. Yeah. 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 That uh, that white stuff's gonna arrive sooner than later. Although I th- I think we're still trying to get in a couple of golf games before that happens. Uh, in terms of the flight school, uh, Alex, uh, is anything in the training that you've been able to transition into your superbike racing? Because obviously you've got to be very precise whether you're on, uh, you know, in a plane or on that uh, on that superbike. And and when do you solo? When do you when when do you get your solo flight? 
I I feel like it's more motorcycle that helped me get be a little bit better at flying than the other way because I I have like I have maybe sixty something hours of flight time so it's not it's not a lot compared to how many like days of track day and racing stuff that I did on a motorcycle so it's not it's not the same I feel like more motorcycle helped me with flying than the other way around but uh no it's been it's been pretty good and uh I've been I've been soloing for a couple months now okay I'm getting close to do my uh my uh private pilot license exam soon uh both uh theory and uh flight both exams so it's gonna be pretty good and then I'll, after that i'll be i'll have my my regular license like uh somebody that has a plane and just flies around for fun so i'll be able to uh take some passengers uh, with me if i want that'd be pretty cool are you yeah. going to be flying to the races next year maybe it's not a really fast plane so it's almost quicker <laughs> with a car but uh no it's gonna be maybe i'd like to yeah. and make a good uh a good flight yeah and if your road racing career doesn't take you back to moto america uh maybe in the superbike class or moto gp or, or or world superbike now we're we're shooting uh you know we're shooting really high here uh if you do become a uh, a pilot what where would you like to to go there is there a, a commercial plane that uh, that you're a big fan of i don't know i'm i mean i don't know i, I know i want to be a like a airline pilot the more uh, like a couple of years into my career in flying yeah first couple of years there's so many because you have to get a certain amount of hours to get a uh, to be able to get a uh, to work for a big airline company so there, but there's so many ways that you can build up your hours of flight time before that you can get that opportunity to do so there's i don't know there's so many different like uh, airplane industries that you can do you can go up north you can do uh like small uh, travel, you can, there's so many like bush flying, uh, there's so many, so many dif different kind of uh, work you can do in the, the pilot industry. So I don't know, I guess it's gonna be more with what I have, uh, what, what's uh, available to do. And if I like it, I'll continue. If not, I'll maybe change. So yeah, it's pretty much up in the air and I'll see, uh, what are the opportunities? Up in the air, no pun intended. Uh, Stuart, I think we may have some uh, comments or questions for Alex. Why don't we look at those? And then I want to come back, Alex, and talk about uh, a subject that uh, Stuart brought up when Ben Young was on the show a few weeks ago. And that is the little incident in turn number two when uh, you and Ben try to congratulate each other. <laughs> We've got Ben's version of the story. We want to get yours. But Stuart, what do we got in the Q&A? Yeah, first question for Alex, Pat, is uh, which brand he will be racing next year, if he'll be back with Suzuki or will he be looking at other opportunities? Uh, that's a good question. We don't, it's not official yet. We're uh, still, we're talking with the Suzuki guys. They, they want me uh, again next year. And uh, so do I, because it's a, uh, it was a really good bike this year. It's, I've been racing uh, the Jixxer 1000 for two years now. So, I mean, it's it's the only uh, 1000 bike that I really know. Well, that I've, I've never really ridden uh, other brands. So I really like it. I like the way it, it works. And uh, I, th I mean, I think in the best, I think I, I still want to continue with Suzuki. So we'll see what happens. But uh, as of right now, I'll, I want to race uh, with them uh, next year. And, and further to that, Alex, um, what was it like racing against the bikes of Ben Young and Jordan Zoke with you on the Suzuki? I know Patrice builds really good motorcycles and it looked really close at most port, but did you see that, did your bike have advantages in some areas versus their bike or vice versa? I know uh, suspension wise, uh, 
we we were working on a pretty good uh, setup. So at Calabogie, it made it made a big difference compared to the the other guys. I know they were, they were working hard also, but I still feel like I had a small advantage in that because uh, especially the last round, I didn't felt like I was pushing as hard as the first round, and I was able to be uh, quicker. Uh, it felt easier, smoother, and I was able to be even more consistent in the first round with my lap times. And uh, just dropping the times was pretty easy. So uh, I feel, I don't know. The setup-wise, I feel like uh, I had a really good bike. Uh, Engine-wise, uh, Patrice built me a spec, uh, a stock 1000 bike spec for uh, Motor America. So we didn't get really the advantage that we could have in the super bike. But uh, next year we're gonna have a, a real uh, super bike uh, build. So, so. so you guys will go with a super a CSBK super bike spec motor. Yep, for next year. Yep. Awesome. And a couple, one other thing, we I've got uh, some people asking the correct pronunciation of your last name. If you could share that with the folks watching. Uh, in French, the D is pretty hard to uh, pronounce for the English, so uh, but we don't pronounce the S at the end, so it's just, okay. it's just uh, Duma. Duma, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I guess the only thing outside of that with the flying is Pat. We'll have to connect if he hasn't already. You have to connect Alex with Brad McRae. Uh, yeah. Well, Brad. Uh... Brad flies helicopters, and I think uh, Alex is uh, a fixed wing guy. Oh, okay. Sure. Sorry, my my bad. Yeah, yeah. I know. Maybe maybe Brad does have his other pilot's license, but I know he's a he's an expert helicopter uh, pilot. That's uh, that's for sure. Uh, anything else, Stuart, for uh, for Alex before we move on? No, we're clear. You go ahead, Pat. Alex. Um, we had uh, Jordan Zolk and, and Ben Young on earlier, and they were very complimentary of you and uh, just how hard you guys were all riding, but very clean, very safe, and nobody was doing anything uh, crazy out there. Compare um, the top level of riders that you raced against here at CSBK and your uh, season in Moto America uh, stock 1000? I'd say the level, uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, I, it's hard to tell because I feel like I've, I've gained, a, I've got a little bit quicker since last year on the on a 1000. Yep. And last year I couldn't quite be able to win in the stock 1000. Um, I feel like it's pretty much even, the stock 1000 in Mon America, uh, like Caliber and the one in Superbike here in CSBK. Yeah. It's just, uh, I feel like it's the same, the top two, three guys are the same. It's just in Mon America, they have more, like the field is uh, a little bit deeper in the terms of uh, quickness, I'd say. Yeah. Like here in the top 10, compared to the, uh, in the US in top 10, there's more faster guys in the top 10 in the US than here in uh, CSBK. Yeah. But, but I feel like the level up front is pretty much right. even. So if you, Jordan, and, and Ben, and, and maybe Trevor, for instance, and uh, maybe uh, uh, Tommy Cassis, those five guys went to Moto America Stock 1000 they'd be able to run in the top 10 there, maybe top a bunch of them, top five and finish on the podium. Yeah, that's what I think, yeah. Okay, um, let's get back to the cool down lap at uh, uh, CTMP uh, in, uh, in August. Uh, we've heard Ben's version of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, exactly, what exactly happened? Uh, it was pretty much me being a 19 year old kid and just not paying attention pretty much. <laughs> That's what happened. I, I came to uh, come and just tap the back of Ben and uh, 
I mean, he didn't see me. I think he was kind of, I, I didn't really talk about him of that afterwards, but I think he was pretty much surprised to see me there. And he kind of turned to me and then I was pretty close to his bike, but not to like clip his uh, handlebar. And he was kind of, he kind of turned around and he kind of went into my bike and we kind of hit the, the clip-ons and then he crashed and I kind of, I stayed upright but then his bike was going towards, uh, like it was just parallel to me and just crashing the same speed. And then I had nowhere to go because turn two kind of, well, it goes to the left. So the yeah. wall was coming and there was the grass and the hay bales. So I tried to break as hard as I can the pavement and then I let off the brakes and then I saw the, the hay bales. So I just ditched the bike and face plant into the, the hay bales. Yeah, uh, what did Patrice say to you when you finally made it uh, back to the pits? Uh, what kind of shape was the bike in? Oh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I broke the the windscreen, just a couple of scratches. I, I think the worst uh, the worst thing that happened to it was the the spools where you put the the stand on, like it's like a, you put the stand on yep. it. It uh, it actually uh, broke off the the swing arm so we had to get another uh, piece of uh, aluminum welded back on the swing arm and put some uh, uh i forgot how to say in english but you know when you put the screw in like the the stuff inside like the like you know a nut like you have a screw in a nut yeah inside the nut. how do you call it like it's uh like sure is those. it time at a washer? Like that. How do you call those? Threads. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. So we got to get another piece, uh, like a round piece welded back on and put some threads in it to uh, put back another spool. But uh, no, overall, uh, the bike was pretty good. I think Ben's bike was a little bit more scratched than mine because uh, mine only crashed in the grass, but his uh, scraped on the 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 pavement for pretty good time so yeah i felt a little bit bad but you went on to win the championship and as billy shakespeare says all's well that ends well uh yeah. Stuart, we've got uh, a couple of more questions there for alex yeah we've just got a comment here uh pat from franz walker saying he'd like to thank alex for trusting him with his class at the fast school while he was preparing for the ctmp race it was a great time who, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the name, his name? Franz Walker. Franz Walker. With, with Liquid Mall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, Franz? Yeah, I, I met uh, Franz at, at uh, Fast Running School this year. Yeah, did Franz tell you how fast he was on a Yamaha RZ350 back in his day? Uh... I mean, he, he, I knew that he raced, but I didn't know how quick uh, he was. He was pretty fast. He was, uh, <laughs> you know, top five, top 10. Yeah. And, and may even won a few races. Uh, Alex, what's the plan for the, uh, for the off season? Um, any, any racing at all between now and the opening round of CSBK as it sits right now? Um, I'd like, I'd like to do some ice racing. There wasn't any, I think there was no, there was no, uh, ice racing last uh, winter, uh, because, uh, because of COVID and also yeah. our local, uh, series, uh, they kind of stopped go, uh, doing races since COVID and they're still, they, they just stopped completely. So they're, even if COVID wasn't anymore around. They would uh they're not continuing continuing so i'm gonna have to go a little bit more up north north of uh, montreal a couple hours to uh go race if there is some races because there's another association uh, up there because there's a lot of lakes but uh i'd like to do ice racing or just ride on the ice for fun and then also i just i bought a new uh, snowmobile for this year so i'll be riding it uh this year and uh I'm going to continue my uh, flight uh, uh, school. And um, yeah, that's going to be pretty much my uh, what my winter is going to look like. And what about in terms of uh, 
uh, working out and, and getting in shape for the upcoming season. I know Ben was talking about all the uh, cycling and rowing and all that stuff that uh, that he does. Is that uh, an area of your preparation that you're looking to maybe uh, take to a new level for next season? Of course, I never... I know the, there's a lot of, uh, of guys of my age that work out a lot. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't like it. I do it, but I, I don't like it. I, I like to do it uh, by like riding motorcycles or riding mountain bikes just by doing something fun and at the same time uh, physical. So uh, I like this year because, it, I mean, it's not expensive to just ride a, a dirt bike on the ice all winter long so i'd like just to do a lot of uh, ice racing it's uh yeah. it's harder than motocross physically it's really like it you do like 10 minutes 10 15 minutes of it then you're, you're done it's it's really hard uh, physically and mentally also but it's so much fun and uh it's something that i and also one of my uh, dad's friend he uh were uh, nearby uh a lake here where i live at and he, uh, him and his friend, they, uh, they plow the snow uh, and they do like a novel on the ice. So yep. it's not even 10 minutes from my house. So uh, I'd like just to go ride there uh, during the, the winter and uh, ride a lot. I think that's going to be one of, the, one of my hobbies uh, this winter. And uh, yeah. Okay. Stuart, we've got anything else for Alex in terms of Q&A. And again, for those uh, who are on Track Announcers Don't Book tonight, feel free to use the Q&A if you've got a question or a comment for the 2021 Canadian Superbike uh, champion, Alex Dumas. Uh, please hop on there. We're, uh, we've got a couple of more minutes before we uh, dedicate the final 10 minutes of the show to uh, pay tribute to the late Wes Cooley. Stuart? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just for Alex, of, of the two tracks you did get to race at this year, did you have a preference of Calabogi or CTMP as your favorite? I'd say uh, one thing, but it's hard to tell. They're both, they're both to me, uh, a little bit different, but they're both uh, as fun to go at. I'd say... That's in Mossport because of the back straightaway. It's just so much fun. I mean, my my two, three uh, favorite tracks in the U.S. are Road America and Road Atlanta and uh, Utah because of the straightaways. So I have to say Mossport. But at the same time, I really like the layout of uh, Calabogi. It's really interesting. I've never really raced at a place that has so many different uh, sectors and different corners and it's really fun, but uh, I gotta say, uh, I gotta say, Mossport, just because of the straightaways and the how fast it is, and it's so cool. That's interesting, Alex, because you're four for four at uh, Calabogie, but zero for three at uh, Canadian Tire <laughs> Motorsport Park. But I can uh, I can un understand your your sentiment. That run out of the I don't know if you're in first gear coming out of uh, 5B out of the Moss hairpin and then getting up to, I don't know what, you've got to be getting close to uh, 270 or 80 kilometers an hour up at the top of the Andretti straight. Yeah. Stuart, anything else for, uh, for Alex? There's just been a few others, and along with everyone else, they just congratulate Alex on an, an exceptional season. And I just want to say the same. Congratulations on the uh, National Superbike Championship and Rookie of the Year honors all at the, all in the same year. Pretty uh, pretty impressive. Thank you very much, Stuart. Well, and and uh, thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Alex, you're, you're welcome to, uh, uh, to stick around uh, as we uh, play uh we'll go through some photos of the late uh Wes Cooley who was uh a pretty quick rider as well a lot of his career on uh Suzuki motorcycles but he also raced Yamaha and, and towards the end of his career uh probably his uh his best finish in the Daytona 200 uh came uh, on the Honda behind Freddie Spencer 
in, uh, in 1985. So I want to thank uh, Alex for, uh, for coming on the show. Uh, congratulate him on the Superbike Championship, and we look forward to seeing him as he uh, defends that, uh, that championship. Thanks, Brad. So, Stuart, um, we lost uh, one of the greats, uh, Wes Cooley. Uh, that golden era of superbike racing, as, uh, as, as many of you know, uh, the superbikes uh, kicked off at Daytona in 1976, and it was only three years later that uh, uh, Cooley was part of that uh, amazing sweep of the superbike race at Daytona with there's uh, Pops uh, Yoshimura as the uh, Yoshimura Suzuki's were one, two, three in 1979 at, uh, at Daytona. Uh, Ron Pierce took the win, Wes Cooley was second and uh, the late uh, David MD finished uh, in third. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Bill Petro and Colin Fraser for sharing uh, some of the images they have of, uh, of Wes Cooley racing both uh, at Daytona and uh, his trips here to Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, Motorsport as it was known at the time, uh, to take part in some of our big motorcycle race weekends here. So these are uh, some of the images from, uh, from Bill Petro. There's uh, Cooley uh, on his uh, number 34, uh, believe that was uh, his Yamaha that year. Uh, Calgard, I think, was one of his sponsors, but that's a great shot of him in the uh, on his uh, Daytona uh, 200 bike. Uh, he raced from 1975 to 1985 in the Daytona 200 and uh, never did win it. Had a lot of success though in the superbike class. And that is uh, vintage Wes Cooley, familiar number. 34 that uh, in in recent years Michael Barnes has sort of taken over the uh, that number and this was uh, the shot from Daytona 1979 the Bell Superbike 100 Bell helmets used to sponsor the race back then that is Ron Pierce in the middle who won the race uh, Wes Cooley to his right and uh, a very young uh, David MD who finished third uh, third that day, and I guess you see the can of Pepsi Cola in uh, in Ron Pierce's left hand. I, I wonder if that is uh, actually a Pepsi Stewart or whether that's a Pepsi label on a can of beer. We'll never know. <laughs> This is one of Colin Fraser's, Pat, from Mosport. Uh, this was him pre-race. Yeah, I guess uh, Wes uh, trying to mentally get himself psyched up and focused. And as we said, the, uh, the late owner of Mosport, uh, Harvey Udis, uh, brought Wes up, uh, I think maybe three times, maybe four, but um, it was always great to see a top-level American rider like this come up and run against the likes of Reuben McMurder and Lang Hindle and, and others uh, really uh, created uh, just a great race weekend and a great feature race. This is from uh, Bill Petro, 1979. This was following uh, Wes Cooley's podium finish in the superbike race at, uh, at Daytona. And uh, he was up here on his uh, Formula One machine. And another uh, classic Wes Cooley leaned over. And uh, yeah, that, uh, those bikes sounded incredible at, uh, at full revs as they uh, made their way around Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, Mosport at the time. And uh, this is a classic signature Bill Petro photo of, uh, of Wes Cooley. And uh, 33, Steve Gervais, and 203, uh, Lang Hindle. But uh, Bill, I think, would sit backwards on a motorcycle, or at times I think he got smarter and he, he went in the back of a pickup truck and 
got these uh, amazing photos. Yeah, they were, uh, they were dragging knees back then, Stuart, even without the knee sliders. Yeah, I have to say, Pat, I, um, as a lot of people did, I had a, my first road racing helmet was a West Cooley Model Arai helmet, and it was awesome. Okay, before we go on, uh, this is, uh, again, another classic. They changed the paint schemes uh, over the years from the red, black, and white that you saw back in 79 to more of a Suzuki blue and white with uh, some red accents. That was uh, 1981. I think it was the year Wes uh, won the Superbike uh, 100. And there he is in uh, victory lane at Daytona and uh, holding up the, uh, the Bell Helmet uh, trophy, although he was uh, an awry guy for most of, uh, most of his uh, career. That's, uh, that's it for the photos that we got from Colin and, and Bill Pat. Well, that's, uh, that's great. Stuart, I think we've got uh, some comments, questions. Again, we invite those who are uh, on uh, the show tonight to feel free to share a favorite Wes Cooley uh, memory, or maybe you were at uh, Mosport back in the late 70s, early 80s, and saw Wes Cooley there on his uh, Suzuki's being part of our big race weekends. Yeah, Pat, uh, our good friend of the show, Henry DeGao, he's commented that uh, Wes was also a rider that went to the Macau GP. And in 1988, it was the same year that Kevin Schwantz won it. So I guess the irony is a pair of number 34s. Um, and that that was Schwantz's number. And Wes did Macau as a holiday race and vacation back there. He said he was an extremely nice guy on top of being one of the greats. And I think that's the one thing I found reading in, in researching a bunch of Wes Cooley's past, Pat, is just what an exceptional person he was. Yeah, very, uh, very down to earth. Any of the conversations I had with him, very talented, fiercely competitive, but very grounded and down to earth. No prima donna, uh, prima donna at all. And of course, uh, he really added to those uh, super, super bike uh, and uh, motorcycle racing weekends at, uh, at Mosport. And I'll go to some of the other comments, Pat. Uh, Steve Smart, who's with us this evening, Steve had one of Wes Cooley's ex Yoshimura Katanas, and um, he bought it from uh, George Kudrana, Kudranzans. I think that's the name, back in 1984. And uh, that bike now is residing with uh, Ken Edgar in Ohio. Okay. Anything else, Stuart? Uh, yeah, just uh, Nathan Naslin pointed out that back then in those pictures, they didn't wear any, uh, no hard puck knee sliders. It was uh, all leather back then. And um, the only other comment we have, Pat, was um, for Alex. And a couple of people have put in that uh, they're really glad that he'll be back racing in Canada next season. And they can't wait to see what bike he's racing and they'll be uh, cheering for him. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Alex, uh, let us know when you sign the contract and, uh, you know, we'll certainly have you back on the show uh, before the start of the uh, CSBK uh, season in, uh, in 2022. I'm not sure how soon a schedule is going to be published. Uh, earlier, of course, we shared the SOAR uh, schedule that uh, Ken McAdam released today. And hopefully with uh, before the end of the year, uh, Colin Fraser will be able to release the uh, CSBK uh, season for, uh, for 2022. Uh, Alex, any of the um, tracks that you didn't race on this year uh, that you're looking to, uh, to get to in 2022? I know you know Shannonville, but uh, I don't think you've been to Atlantic Motorsport Park. Nope. I have it. Uh, that's uh, Shuby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I've I've never even watched a video or something, so I'm probably gonna have to watch some videos and see some uh, racing. There's probably some on YouTube or something, so I'm probably gonna take a look at that. And uh, also, uh, I've seen a race at Grand Bend. Yeah. Uh, from two years ago, I think, with uh, Ben and Jordan and all those guys. Yeah. It looks like a pretty flat track. Uh, yeah. 
looks also there's like multiple uh, ways that you can do the track and every uh, seam has a pretty big bump. So uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be just an interesting, uh, I mean, it's always good to do the more, the, uh, like more tracks during the season than only uh, two. So uh, I'm really, even though they're not the, they don't look like the, the greatest tracks, I still feel like it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna make a good championship to have, uh, to have different tracks during the, the summer. Well, hopefully the series is back at Shannonville in 2022. That remains to be seen. But of the different track configurations at, uh, at Shannonville, uh, from the time you've spent there with the fast riding school, which, which one, uh, is, is your favorite long track pro track? Cause I think it'll be either one let's of say, those. Let's say the pro track, especially for 1000. I feel the other, the long track is pretty tight for, uh, yeah. and also pretty bumpy. Cause if you did the long track, uh, turn four, five, turn six, I believe it's like a double, uh, yeah, you've got a bunch of the older older pavement there, and you know, and no plans are to do some repaving there down the road. But whether or not uh, the uh, series gets to Shannonville next year, I guess we'll uh, we'll find out in the next few months. Well, that is going to wrap up this edition of uh, of Track Announcers Notebook. Uh, just before we go, Stuart, any last minute uh, comments or questions before we? wrap up just that daryl fletcher wanted to share that uh gary goodfellow back in the day at westwood brought west cooley to that event as well and uh he said it was an awesome time back then when that happened that was 1990 okay so that would have been right at the end of uh of wes's career and he might only have been a, a part-time uh a part-time racer back then uh that yeah. what might have been the final year of uh, westwood i did not know uh, Wes Cooley had uh, had made it to uh, to the Westwood uh, racetrack, but that's uh, that's cool. So the only other not... the only other thing, Pat, I wanted to sort of just to uh, didn't mean to interrupt you, is uh, for people to go on to InsideMotorcycles.com and read Colin Fraser's blog about the late Wes Cooley because he's got an incredible article with a nice collection of photos, and it's uh, it's a great read. Yeah, indeed. Um, and again, I want to thank Bill Petro and Colin Fraser for sharing some of their images of, uh, of Wes Cooley uh, with us tonight that we were able to share with you. So I want to thank uh, Alex Duma for joining us here tonight on uh, Track Announcer's Notebook. Thanks to all of you for uh, being a great, uh, a great audience. Stuart will have this uh, show up on our YouTube channel a little later on in the week if you want to let uh, a friend or family member know to, uh, to check it out. And uh, we'll see you here next Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. Have a great week and uh, be well. Thank you very much.